If you're watching this video on YouTube, just know that I have other videos uh, on Odyssey, uh, BitChute, uh, and maybe other uh, uh, websites uh, as I decide, uh, other than YouTube. Uh, the links are in the down there, down there somewhere, um, to those other uh, channels on those other sites. Um, and I recommend uh, that everybody else start moving away from YouTube as well. Uh, I opened some of these accounts years ago and uh, only now I'm getting around to using them. So go ahead and uh, if you want, you can click on the down there and uh, see the other content, which usually mirrors what I have on YouTube. Uh, you can see that stuff if you like and follow me over there if you like. Uh, anyway, on to the video. Hello, this video is uh, part of a series about missile detection, I want particular ICBM uh, uh, detection, uh, and nuclear detonation detection. Uh, for this particular video, what we're going to do is go over uh, one method of detecting the launch of nuclear weapons and other uh, uh, missiles and, uh, and rockets as well. Um, we could do a couple other things with it, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, this uh, particular system is called the Defense Support uh, Program. Uh, DSP is what we used to call it when I was in the military because we were lazy and we didn't want to say Defense Support Program, we would just use DSP. Except when you were, you know, looking, uh, talking about uh, digital signal processing, then you'd get confused. Anyway, besides that, that's beside the point. What does this thing do? Well, this system is designed to detect uh, missiles, ICBMs, uh, in the boost phase in their flight. Okay, so it provides boost phase missile warning. Now, what is boost phase missile warning? What is the boost phase? Well, the boost phase is uh, the phase of flight for an ICBM where it is being powered and lifted up away from the Earth. All right. It's kind of like uh, when you are in an airport and you get on your airplane and you get on your flight, your flight has three general phases, okay, and these phases can also be split up into their own little parts, but three general phases. Uh, you have departure and climb, then you have your cruise, uh, where you're up at your altitude, your cruising altitude, and every, you know, that's when the drinks come out and whatever. Uh, and then you have your descent and landing, all right? Similarly, uh, the flight of a ballistic missile is divided into three overall phases. Here we have the boost phase, and, and this is, like I said, where the, the missile is, the engine is on, the, the rocket engine is on, okay? Whether, whether, it doesn't matter what type of engine that is, it could be a solid propellant, a liquid propellant, bipropellant, whatever. Uh, but the engine's on, and it's hot, it's fuel, hot gases out of it, and it's going up, okay? Or sideways, kind of, all right? The second phase here is called the mid-course, uh, and this is basically when it's just at the top of its ballistic trajectory, okay, it's at the top there, uh, and it's just cruising, all right, it, it's equivalent, you could say, to your aircraft's cruising uh, phase. You have the terminal phase here, which is where the warheads are re-entering the atmosphere and, and trying to uh, go after the targets that they've been assigned to hit, okay, or I should say attack. All right. Uh, you'll notice that these two here are not powered phases of flight. Uh, this one relies on the energy that the boost phase gave it, uh, and this one relies on gravity to do most of the work. Uh, the boost phase here is the only one that's powered, uh, and that's important for this particular example because um, this powered part where the rocket engine is on and the, the hot gas, that's what we're going to be looking for with this system. The system looks for the heat caused by that hot gas uh, from the, during boost phase. All right. Uh, so this thing is in a orbit that's pretty far out there. It's a near geostationary orbit, about twenty-two thousand miles up, or about thirty-five thousand kilometers up from the Earth's surface. Um, and near geostationary sounds odd. Um, I wrote it that way uh, just because there's some interesting things about the way it orbits. Uh, it's an equatorial orbit, okay, but there's some interesting things about how it aligns itself and, and, and uh, so on. Um, but we're not going to get into those. Just be aware that it's uh, an equ equatorial orbit. It's way out there, all right? Now, this system, uh, it 
seems like it would be relatively old, which it, I guess it is. It's older than I am, you know. But uh, and, and I'm not. I'm not a spring chicken. I'm not old, but I'm not a spring chicken. Uh, this system uh, replaced Midas in the uh, early 1970s. That's when the first launches were uh, were done, and uh, when these satellites started getting into their uh, final orbits. That uh, was the early 1970s. Midas uh, was the missile detection alarm system. It was a similar system to this, uh, quite a bit more primitive. Uh, worked in a completely different way as far as the orbits go. Uh, the sensors, like I said, they were a little more primitive, oh, quite a bit more primitive, uh, so on and so forth. All right. Uh, you could say that it was almost a test bed for this type of technology here. Okay. Uh, now, as I said before, this system uh, detects launches, it detects ICBM launches by looking for their infrared signatures, okay? And what is the infrared signature? Well, it's heat. Infrared is heat, okay? So that's what it's looking for. It's looking for the heat of those exhaust plumes, all right? Which at this distance, at 22,000 miles away, are pretty small, all right? And that leads to some interesting things about this, uh, this system, the way it's designed, which we'll talk about here. Uh, the data gathered from this satellite, or this system of satellites, this constellation, if you want to call it that, can be used to develop trajectory and impact predictions. Now, the trajectory predictions uh, is a prediction on the path the satellite is going to, or not the satellite, the path that the missile and the warhead will fly along, fly along, okay, that they'll move along, okay? Uh, and the impact predictions are based on that, uh, and that's where the missile or the warhead, I should say, uh, or warheads will uh, possibly attack. Uh, you can't make predictions about the warheads themselves from this system, uh, but you can, in conjunction with a lot of other data, uh, make uh, guesses at where, educated guesses at where they'll hit. All right. Now this system, because it's old, uh, it still works fine though. Uh, because it's old, it's going to be replaced by a new system called SIGRS or Space Based Infrared System. All right. Uh, we're not going to go into that in this video, that's for another video. Just like my distance is going to be for another video. Uh, bang meters will also be for yet another video, but we'll mention them here. Bang meters basically can detect nuclear detonations and other phenomena that are similar. All right. Uh, this has them on there, but that's not the point of the system. Okay. So why don't we go in and uh, take, start taking a look at the details of, uh, of these DSP satellites. All right, let's take a look at uh, the satellite itself. The satellite is split into two overall parts, okay? You've got the body here. This has all the electronics and things in there, uh, batteries and, you know. Uh, in fact, this entire thing here is covered with solar, solar cells. Uh, the only part of the satellite, some of their different versions of this that look different, okay, but they all have this general layout. Uh, most versions that this is entirely or almost entirely covered by solar cells. There's uh, four solar panels that stick out the back of this too, which I haven't drawn for clarity here. Um, and uh, then you've got this thing, which is essentially the only part of the satellite that's not covered with solar panels. Uh, in addition to uh, the back. Uh, uh, side of the cylinder here, the back end of the cylinder is not covered, okay, depending on the, the version of the satellite, all right. Uh, so that's the main, the body of the satellite, if you will. Uh, then you've got this thing out here, which is the detection and a shroud and a telescope and things like that, okay. This is the eyeball, if you want to call it that, okay. Now, uh, this thing rotates once it's in orbit, once it's in the orbit uh, that it's supposed to be at, at the location it's supposed to be at, and so on and so forth. Uh, it rotates, the whole, the whole satellite rotates. This thing up here isn't the only thing that rotates, the whole thing rotates, all right? And it rotates at a rate of about, well, not about, a rate of six RPM, six rotations a minute, okay? Uh, so each one of these rotations takes six, uh, ten seconds, okay? Uh, and that will become important as we look at this thing here, what, the eyeball, the sensor system, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at the, the pointing, the, or, the orientation that this satellite uh, takes on. Is, is you'll notice here that there's no like little motors, little rocket motors or uh, thrusters or anything on this, all right? And that's because the, the, the satellite uh, 
can rotate the, uh, itself uh, to point in different directions by means of something called a reaction wheel. Okay, so this satellite uses reaction wheels uh, to basically figure out how to point somewhere, or to control, not figure it out, but to control uh, the direction it's pointing, okay? And also to control uh, that 6 RPM, all right? Uh, which kind of leads me to an interesting thing. Uh, when this thing gets put in orbit, it, it, gets, uh, it goes uh, up, you know, at liftoff, and it goes into a low uh, parking orbit there around the Earth, very low altitude orbit. Um, and it sits there for a little bit and does its checkouts and things like that. And then when it gets to the proper place uh, in this orbit after everything's all right, uh, it will do a burn to put it out to about 22,000 miles, okay? Uh, and during that burn, during that whole time, it's got a, a booster attached to here with some thrusters on it and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, and as it's moving out, out along during this journey here from uh, low Earth orbit to 22, from that parking orbit to 22,000 miles, uh, one of the interesting things that happens, and this happens with uh, quite a few satellites that, that uh, are put out there, is that it just doesn't stay in one orientation uh, for the whole flight, let's just say like this, for the whole flight out there. What that booster section at the back will do is it will rotate the satellite, or the whole, the whole vehicle essentially, okay, the satellite plus the booster, uh, to maintain even heating, all right, even heat distribution on the system, okay. I'm not going to go into that too in depth. Just it's interesting in my mind to to uh, bring that up, okay. Now that's different from this six RPM rotation. It has nothing to do with the six RPM rotation, okay. Uh, that setup, once this uh, thing gets out to about near the twenty-two thousand mile uh, orbit, uh, it jettisons that booster section and the thrusters, you know, uh, uh, on it. And then it, we use those reaction wheels to set up the 6 RPM rotation, okay? Once that's set up, and uh, once there's some other uh, criteria that go on there too, uh, this thing will start to look for the sun. It's got some sun trackers on there, it's got some earth finders and so on and so forth. So it'll start to look for the sun, okay, uh, and then orient itself uh, because remember that this is the direction of travel, okay? It's traveling this way. The Earth will be either on this side, uh, well actually the Earth will be on this side of it, all right? If I remember correctly. Either way, the Earth is to a side. It's not in the back or the front, all right? Uh, so this thing needs to get itself turned around and pointed toward Earth, okay? And it does that uh, using the reaction wheels to control the, uh, to actually uh, move it, to rotate the satellite, um, and then it's going to look for the sun uh, with the sun tracker, which is kind of interesting in satellite systems. You have uh, star trackers, sun trackers, uh, other object trackers. Kind of interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to get off, off topic here. That might be another video I do eventually. Anyway, um, so it's looking for the sun, and it finds the sun when it has that, when it's found that, it, it has a point of reference there, okay? Then it can start to move and try and find the Earth as well, okay? The whole point of that is that it wants to get this uh, eye here, we're going to call it eye for now, this whole eye here, it wants to have it pointed at Earth, okay? And uh, once it gets this pointed at Earth, there is a cover on, on this end, because this end is open, essentially, uh, to a point. Um, Optically, it's it's open. Uh, this has a cover on here that will get ejected. Okay, it'll just get, get out of here. Cover, go away. And and uh, the reason, uh, one of the reasons it has this cover on here, is that like your own eyeball, you don't want when this thing is flopping around and doing its gymnastics in space uh, to get aligned properly. You don't want this thing to go and and rotate around where it's, it's looking at the sun for a moment because like your eyeball it, that can damage the optics in here the system okay so that's why one of the reasons this cover is on here so you, that cover gets jettisoned okay uh, and then at that point the satellite as far as or, uh, orientation is set up okay 
So let's take a look at uh, the systems in the satellite itself, uh, the important one at least, which is that weird looking off-center telescope thing. All right, so this telescope thing is what's called a Schmidt telescope. Okay, it's not a normal telescope. It's a special one. It's called a Schmidt telescope. Uh, it's got a wide field. The, the attributes of this that we want for this particular application are that it has a wide field of view, so it's a very wide field of view. Uh, uh, it can see a lot of things, I mean, all right? Uh, and it's got good image quality, okay? That means there's not a lot of, um, that the optics of this thing don't introduce a lot of uh, uh, blurring and you know, weird things, aberrations and so on, uh, to the image, all right? And that's why it's used, okay? Uh, because this needs to be very accurate, all right? So we don't want any of those aberrations. Now, how is this thing built? Well, if we were to take this assembly, essentially what we would find, if we simplify it enough, is we'd find you've got a reflector telescope, which I've drawn here. This is reflect. Ignore the lens, please. Uh, this is essentially a reflector telescope uh, where the light comes, if you're not familiar with what that is, the light comes in through this end here, this end is open. The light comes in, it bounces off the mirror that is in the opposite end here and goes to some sort of optics. In this case, it's going to be a detector, all right? Now, when this happens, um, there's some, uh, there is uh, uh, some aberrations and things uh, that are introduced from this mirror and all this crap down at the back here, okay? Now those can be corrected for if we were to uh, add a lens at this end. And that's what, what they've done with this, okay? The guy who, who came up with this, actually I believe it's attributed to several people if I remember correctly, but uh, the guy that they aimed it after, Schmidt, uh, I believe he was also, he was a... Op, not an optometrist, but an optical optical physicist. I don't know what it's called. A guy that does optics for a living. Okay, not for your eyeballs either. Uh, for eyeballs like this. Anyway, so the light comes in. This will correct. This does, this does correction here. That's what this lens does. It corrects for the aberrations introduced on this end of the telescope. So the light will come in here on this end. It'll go through this lens, which will do some correcting. Then bounce like a normal reflector, bounce off the mirror here and go to your optics, which in, like I said in this case is your detector, okay? So what we'll say is that this combines a reflecting telescope and a refracting telescope, all right? Uh, the detector, which is interesting about this particular system, the detector uh, for this is cryogenically cooled, all right? Uh, and you need that because, like I said before, the, the, at 22,000 miles away, the heat plume from an ICBM or another missile or, or I should say other types of missiles and so on and so forth, they're very small. They're a little bit hard to see. So by cooling the detector, you make it easier to uh, uh, see those. Um, you make it easier for that IR radiation to uh, activate the detector in the way that you need it to activate it, all right? Uh, there's some, there's other reason is you have a cryogenically cooled detector as well. Uh, I'm not going to go on that. Because um, this is not a thing on detectors in cryogenic cooling. All right. uh, as I said before, uh, this type of optical device, it allows uh, for a wide uh, field of view while minimizing the spherical aberration, all right, which is introduced by that end there. All right. Uh, so that's the, uh, this thing here, okay? That's the internals of that. So if you notice here, I've drawn the center line of the satellite, like so, okay? Now it is going through the center of the body of the satellite, but not through the center of this uh, detector array here, this telescope, all right? And there's a reason for that, because it looks like it's kind of cockeyed, mounted at an angle. And it is, okay? If you look at this thing rotating, you'll notice that it, it, this, if you're looking at it from one side, well, from any angle, really, that's the side of it, you'll notice that it, well, it looks like this thing moves back and forth, this particular thing here. It doesn't physically move back and forth like that. It's because it's ro because this thing is mounted off-center, pointing at an angle down like that. 
That's why it looks like, as it rotates through, it looks like it wobbles back and forth. Now, we'll get into why it does that in a minute here, but I've drawn the signal into the body of the satellite, and it goes through more or less the top edge of this, this uh, telescope here, okay? More, more or less, all right? Um, and uh, so you'll notice that that gives, if we have the center of this telescope eventually moving into the center line of the uh, system here, and we have one side of the telescope aligned with the center line of the, the, uh, the satellite, that means that we're going to have this thing offset like this, okay? Uh, and you can see that here, the center line of this, this telescope is has, it's offset from the center line of the satellite, which is also the center line of rotation, okay? Or the axis of rotation, I should say. It is right here, all right? So this detector, the, uh, the axis of this detector is offset, or this telescope is offset from the uh, axis of rotation, all right? Or the center of this detector is, is uh, offset from the, uh, the axis of rotation of the satellite itself, okay? So let's take a look at uh, why that is, okay? Uh, in a system like this, it was fairly old, as I mentioned before, they only had like one to 2,000 uh, detectors on there, and, and they weren't like your video camera detector today, all right? They weren't like your CCD of, of these days, where it's densely packed with detectors on there. Uh, they had a budget of, uh, you, hopefully you can see it on the video, uh, we have the Earth's disk here, and no, I, when I say disk, you know, we use disks, in, when we say a, a, like a Jupiter's disk or Earth's disk or whatever's disk in these things, we don't mean that it's flat, like a flat disk, like your compact disk, no. We mean that when you view it, it looks like a disk, that's all. So, you see Earth's disk here, okay, and the, 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 uh, Axis of rotation of the satellite, which is also the, the top end, the, the uh, top edge of this uh, telescope here, is aligned with the center of the Earth's disk here, or Earth's disk. Okay, it's the center there. Now, because this thing's offset at an angle, this telescope, we can see that the bottom edge of the telescope comes down and it overhangs the edge of the Earth just slightly. All right. And of course, if we look at the, uh, the center line of the telescope here, we see that it comes down to about the middle, more or less, okay? Now, this is uh, important. Uh, this gets into why, uh, or, or I should say, uh, the limited sensors get into, uh, play into why this is shaped like this, okay? Um, it is, it, when you're doing a scan like this, because what this is going to do, the satellite rotates once every uh, uh, six seconds. So you have a rotation, this wedge right here, this is the detection area. It will rotate, it will make a full rotation or a full scan of the Earth every six seconds. So it has ten scans every minute, okay? Uh, and when you're doing this, the area here towards the center more towards the, uh, the center of the Earth here, you are a, you're, you're scanning less area here as the sensor makes a sweep. You're scanning less area than you are out here, okay? So you're going to need more sensors uh, towards the edge than you are towards the center, okay? So this is, has more sensors out here. I mean, you have to have more area for those sensors. Uh, and this will need less area for the sensors. Now, of course, obviously, it's also a geometric thing. If you're going in a circle, well, the natural way to split up a circle like this is a wedge. That's another reason, too. But uh, just be aware that the, the sensor uh, packing in here, arrangement, is uh, a driving factor of why this is shaped like this, okay? Uh, so as this thing rotates, as the satellite rotates, like I said, it will make a scan of the Earth every... Uh, uh, six uh, seconds, or so every ten seconds, I'm sorry. It will make a scan of Earth every ten seconds. Each uh, scan takes six seconds. Six RPM. Uh, yeah, that's right. No. 
Six, oh my God, I am just brain fart today. If you do six RPM, that means every rotation takes it a 10 seconds. Okay, so I was correct the first time. Jeez, I'm not, not doing good today, I guess. Uh, so 10 second uh, scan time, all right? Now you need this quick scan time uh, to track the movement of the missiles, okay? And because there can be not only there can be just one missile coming up from somewhere, uh, and you need to get a good, you need to get several looks at that missile to determine where it's moving. Uh, but you also have to remember that there could be multiple missiles launched, uh, so you want to make sure you have an eye on all of those. Okay. So uh, that's why this this telescope here is offset like this is to allow this sort of scanning. Okay. If we were able to use a, a camera sensor like the one that you have these days, where it could just take a, a wide picture, uh, we, we wouldn't need this offset like this. We could just have it look at the whole thing, all right? And you wouldn't need rotation. Well, let's just say for simplicity, you wouldn't need the satellite to rotate or anything like that, okay? Uh, so let's uh, move back over here. What do we have? Do we have anything on this side? No, I think I've covered everything here. Yeah, so let's go back over here. Okay. Uh, that ten, to ten uh, that scanning and the uh, the frequent looks, uh, frequent views of, of Earth, uh, of a particular area of Earth, being able to view it every once every ten seconds uh, goes into this down here. Now, if we're going to use this thing to predict, or to try and predict where uh, an ICBM is targeted, where the war, well, the ICBM, where it's going, we can't, like I said, we can't necessarily look at the warheads. Or we can't look at the warheads with this system. Uh, we can just look at the boost phase, okay, the, the, the missiles are in the boost phase. What is required to make a prediction of where they're going? We need the launch location, which this gives us, okay, it'll tell us if it sees a, an ICBM coming out of the sea here from a, or a SLBM coming out of the ocean here from a, a, a sub, it's going to see that, all right? But as this rotates around, that missile moves fast enough that it's going to be able to, 10 seconds later, see if it has moved somewhere else, all right? So that will give us the, direct, the direction of travel, being able to do that. Uh, now this one, uh, it depends on, on the missile type, if you can tell the missile type. Uh, the thing uh, with these time of power flight, if you've got a solid fuel uh, ICBM, you're, the time of power flight, well, good luck with that, you know. Anyway, uh, I just lifted this one up here for completeness. Um, you need to know the time and power of flight, all right? Uh, that doesn't play into it uh, as importantly as these other two, uh, because what you can do is if I want to send my ICBM to a location that's closer to me, I'll send it in more of a, a, a vertical and then a path, okay? The trajectory will be uh, very high, all right, very steep, all right? If I want to send it somewhere further away, what I'll do is I'll, I'll flatten out their trajectory so it's more like this, okay, so it'll go further, okay, and that's kind of what I've got down here uh, in this little map, okay. Uh, here we've got a map of North America and Asia, and I'm sure Bob Ross would be jealous of this because it is such an exquisite map. No, he'd probably go, oh my god, that's a happy accident. That's not even a happy accident, that's a horrible accident. Anyway, uh, we've got North America here, we've got Can Canada up on top, and uh, part of the America down here, or up here, I should say. Uh, we've got Asia over here, uh, most likely Russia and uh, Communist China there. Uh, Alright, so, what if you have a this thing detects uh, a missile coming out of he rushes somewhere here, okay, and it's able to, through the 10 seconds, it's able to pick up the launch, and then it, it picks it up here again, here, here, and here. Well, you can make a path from that through this, okay, that this uh, arrow signifies the path that we've determined that this missile is taking. And here is where the engines cut out, where the, the, the rocket engines cut off and are no longer this where the boost phase ends. 
So we've got this data from here to here, all right? Uh, using some other things, we can, uh, the other data that we have, we can probably assume that this is going to be coming to DC, perhaps, in this example, okay? So this thing is going to be targeted, perhaps, at DC, somewhere on the East Coast, maybe. Um, if we have this one here, okay, so this, uh, going back to this one, this one is probably more of a, uh, a launch like this, okay? It's a lob, okay? Not, well, not a lob like you have in tennis. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a flattened trajectory, all right? Long range. This one up here, it looks a little bit short, but let's assume that the time of, of uh, boost phase is the same as this one. So what, what, what assumption can we make with this? Well, we can assume that it's more of a steep trajectory, all right? It's more like this, okay? Uh, so this one might hit, uh, if we've tracked it through the boost phase here, uh, maybe North Dakota, who knows? I don't know, right? Uh, let's just say somewhere, maybe it's targeting the missile fields in North Dakota, right? So we haven't had a nuclear war, thankfully. Uh, so has this system been tested and verified and all that? Well, yes, it has. Uh, because if you remember, I said that this system uh, was designed to not only to detect ICBM or ballistic missiles, uh, SLBMs and ICBMs together, uh, but also other types of missiles. Okay, you can, and you can also detect other types of things with it, but we're sticking to missiles uh, with this. Okay, uh, where do we have it? So the one, perhaps the most famous uh, instance of when this system was used was in the first Gulf War. Uh, where it was able to detect Scud missiles being launched from Iraq uh, towards Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel. Jeez, uh, I can't remember if they were also launched at Kuwait. I don't remember, it's been so long. Uh, but it was able to detect the Scud missiles, and then what, what they would do is, once they had the detection, they would notify uh, Iraq, okay, essentially, simplifying it, notify Iraq, uh, so that the army could launch, uh, hey, you guys need to launch Patriots, all right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, Gulf War Scud missiles. Since then, it's also been uh, uh, other, I guess you could say, famous uh, incidents, what well, we call them incidents, but uh, has been detecting other uh, missile launches like uh, from uh, North Korea and uh, so on and so forth, all right? Now, uh, this system, since I brought up uh, the Gulf War. Uh, this system is ran out of uh, Buckley Air National Guard, eh, not the Air National Guard base, it's 2021, it's Space Force Base. Buckley Space Force Base, uh, I was used to calling it Air National Guard Base because I lived there in the 80s when I had, at, my family uh, was working on one of the squadrons that handled this thing. Uh, Buckley Space Force Base, otherwise known as Aerospace, Defen Aerospace Data Center. C for Colorado is what the C stands for. Uh, so if you're in Denver and you see all those golf balls that are sitting, big golf ball looking things, there's like, uh, I think there's five of them, five of the big ones and then a bunch of small ones. I can't remember, is it four or five? I think it's five. Four in the front, one on, one on, big one on the side, uh, and a bunch of smaller ones. Um, uh, one of the things they do there is they run this thing. And that that is, when they see a missile launch, for example, back in the Gulf War, uh, they would notify whoever. Uh, now, how that actually is broken down, you know, they may have notified uh, NORAD. The NORAD would send the uh, the message out to Iraq or wherever. Uh, maybe they notified the Pentagon, and then that message would get out to the Pentagon. Maybe they used other means, which I'm not going to get into, uh, to note other other uh, communication channels to notify them, so on and so forth. All right. Um, so yeah, this is uh, ran out of Buckley, uh, and the one I'm familiar with, uh, and I, it's funny because I was uh, a couple weeks ago I was looking through some old pictures. I came across one of me in the '80s as a little kid uh, with this big ugly blue hat on from Space Command, which is now the Space Force. All right, but uh, back then it was called Air Force Space Command, uh, and it has the uh, satellite on there. Uh, from the second communication squadron. Back then, the second communication squadron dealt with this. Okay, these days it's called the second uh, space warning squadron, 
with the second communication squadron took their satellite logo the same patch and they moved down to Barksdale Air Force Base and they're just a regular communication squadron now they're not like so they kept the satellite thing and moved it's kind of funny anyway that's how the military works sometimes it doesn't make sense anyway uh, so that's uh, all on uh, DSP uh, so hopefully um, that kind of gave you an idea of uh, what one of the systems, DSP, uh, is or is that we can use uh, uh, to detect or how we detect uh, launches of nuclear and other missiles.